Hi, my name is Allison Tiemann, and I'm the founder of Honey Badger Radio. There's trouble in paradise. Justin Trudeau, current Prime Minister of Canada, and his office stand accused of corrupting the course of justice by pressuring the former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould to spare SNC-Lavalin, a Montreal-based engineering giant, from criminal prosecution. The scandal has already led to two investigations, one by the Justice Committee and another by the Federal Ethics Commissioner. It has also sparked calls from opposition leader Andrew Scheer for Trudeau's resignation and for the RCMP, that is the Mounties, to probe the allegations. The scandal has also seen the resignation of several members of Trudeau's cabinet. It's also seen the Liberals use the majority to block Wilson-Raybould from completing her testimony and to dissolve the Justice Committee investigating the matter. That's not suspicious at all. I remember watching the woman from the Liberal Party tasked with stonewalling complaints from the other parties in in Parliament, and she repeated over and over, we here on this side of the aisle, and then she would insert some platitude, we're not racist, we believe in equal rights, we're not sexist, as if these words had simply become a way for criminals to self-righteously dismiss the exercise of law over them. They have no meaning except we're moral, you're not, you can't judge us. We've done all the right virtue signaling. That means we get out of jail free. Neener, neener, neener. It's sickening. Trudeau wanted to stack his cabinet with giggling handmaidens that hang on his every word, easily manipulated with zero sense of responsibility to anyone but themselves and their silverback gorilla. By the way, when did a man creating a harem become some kind of virtue. Too bad he accidentally appointed a woman with her own agenda. And all of this, Trudeau trying to excuse corporate criminality, is really shining a light on why my lawsuit against the Calgary Expo and the Mary Sue ended with a judgment for the defense. (laughs) For the longest time, I was too close to this to register just how weird it was. The Expo broke its contract with me. I proved that they broke their contract with me. They confessed to breaking their contract with me on the witness stand, and Canadian law, both consumer and contract, is crystal clear that they can't do that. Judgments for refunds in near identical circumstances happen hundreds of times a day. They are completely unremarkable. We've seen Judge Judy make a thousand and one decisions just like that without blinking a damn eye. In any other configuration of parties, this is what would have happened. Okay. Let's say the judge doesn't like me, but the facts are the facts, so judgment for the plaintiff, give her her 750 bucks back for her booth, case dismissed, get out of my court. That's what should have happened. In a sane world, that's what would have happened. This court case isn't important enough to violate precedent and law to deliver the judgment the judge did. It isn't important enough for the defendants to spend over a quarter of a million on vastly inflated as that must be. At most, they would have realistically lost 10k if the judge didn't like them, and have had to issue an apology if the negotiations hadn't fell through. The fact is, every step of the way, my opponents have made this bigger than it actually is. The initial action by the Expo to violate their own contract evict and ban me over nothing. The Mary Sue publishing lies to cover up their partner, the Calgary Expo violating their own contract to evict and ban me over nothing. The Alberta Civil Court giving a judgment to the defense in a case where the defense confessed on the witness stand to violating the law over what amounts to a $750 refund. It's obvious this is not nothing to the Calgary Expo, to the Mary Sue, to the Canadian media, and to the Alberta Civil Courts. I can't count how many times I've been told you didn't really lose all that much. Eh, so that's nothing in the scheme of things. Just walk away. Why are you fighting this? Well, let me turn it around. How much of the fight, how much of a fight is the Expo, the Mary Sue, and the Alberta courts, how much of a fight are you all going to put up against paying 750 bucks or ordering 750 bucks paid? How much, how many more laws are you going to ignore to prevent a corporation giving a refund, a $750 refund for services it was contractually obligated to render, but failed to do so? Is this the hill you all are going to die on? 
Corporations shouldn't have to give consumers refunds when they break their contracts with them because herp, 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 jobs, 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 derp, 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 jobs, jobs, jobs. We here on this side of the aisle, herp, derp, you're a sexist. Let's burn it all down, all of Canada, Canadians' rights under the law, all of their civil liberties, all of it, just to avoid giving a $750 refund. I'm starting to feel like this is a lot bigger than that refund, like something more is going on here. It's really activating the old noodle. That's where the Canadian people are now. The Liberals under Trudeau have used their majority to block the rest of Jody Wilson-Raybould's testimony and dissolve the investigation into their activities. And you can't help but wonder, what the hell are they hiding? Should come as no surprise, Mr. Speaker, because investing in the middle class began with our first day. Anyway, our appeal is moving forward. We have retained the services of a lawyer and have some appeal dates to be, to be chosen from. We're still figuring out when we're exactly we're going to go back to court. It's going to be either June, September, or October. But rest assured, it will happen. And I'm sure the defendants will spend another quarter of a million dollars to avoid paying 750 bucks. And the Canadian judiciary will ignore a few more laws to avoid making the defendants refund my damn 750 bucks. And why am I doing this? Because these laws need to be tested. The Canadian public deserves to know if the Canadian judiciary has their back when they're bullied by corporations and media. They need to know if these laws protect them. And if these laws don't protect us, if the media lies about us because they don't like us, then they need to know that too. They need to know that that's when their laws won't protect them. We need to know what Canadian citizenship is worth. And yeah, I could walk away from this, except I won't because I said I would do it. But aren't you the least bit curious what the hell the Liberal Party is up to? Anyway, here's Brian Martinez, Therapy Snake. Sorry. Therapy Snack, Snake Detective, and Dire Hawk discussing the SNC Lavalin scandal. If you'd like to hear more of the gang's mental musings, head on over to Badger Live Streams, link there, and subscribe. Don't forget, if you like this content and want more of it, support us, and you can do that at feedthebadger.com. Link also here. Now on with the Doge, Snake, and Hawk show. Yay! Hello, everybody, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio once again. My name is Brian, and I'm here with Therapy Snack and Dire Hawk, and we are going to be talking a little bit about a recent investigation, ongoing investigation, rather. Justin Trudeau had been accused of, essentially, of uh, corruption, and there is an investigation ongoing involving SNC Lavalin, a major construction and engineering company based out of Montreal, I believe. I'm an American. I don't know much about Canadian politics. Therapy Snack has done a good deal of research into this subject. So, Snack, could you give us a little bit of a timeline of, and, you know, where we're at in terms of the details around this case? How did this start and so on? Well, the timeline is really long, so it, it depends on where you would want to start with that. But essentially, where things are now is... The government is currently investigating through the Ethics uh, Commission uh, whether or not there was essentially any interference. There's been calls for the RCMP to get involved, though the RCMP has a kind of history and procedure that involves them not commenting on whether or not they've started anything. So, Quick question, what is the RCMP? Oh yes, the, the RCMP is Canada's federal police force. It stands for Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Oh, the Mounties. Okay. But yeah, the, the timeline is quite extensive. Direhawk could probably tell you more. Oh, well, I guess we could start from when things become interesting or, I mean, I don't need everything, but I guess I just want a brief outline of what's happened up until this point. Okay. Well, th then in that case, uh, the fun began during Wilson Raybould, Judy Wilson Raybould's uh, testimony to the House of Commons Justice Committee on uh Wednesday, the 27th of February, she made her kind of groundbreaking testimony that broke publicly. That's when the stuff really got fun. And she mm -hmm. essentially announced that between September and December of 2018, she claims that she was unduly pressured by the Prime Minister's office and the Clerk of the Privy Council and a couple members of Justin Trudeau's cabinet and a few other people I don't believe who were named, who were named, I don't believe they were. So th there's a few people. 
who are involved in this. But essentially, that's kind of the initial beginning of it. And then over the past mm-hmm. little while, we've had about three other people resign. Uh, sorry, two other people resign. Uh, there's a third that people believe might be connected, depending on what the conversation was about. But uh, at least two other people have resigned, including the clerk of the Privy Council, who literally resigned on the 18th of this month, and a high-level cabinet minister. Yeah, and there's also um, one that has actually decided to be in the back benches, not be under the Liberal Party, just to be kind of undeclared. Yeah. You might actually want to say who that woman is. I mean, what her position was. Basically, she was the judge of judges. So kind of like a a Supreme Court judge or head of the Supreme Court for the United States? Yeah, she was the highest judge in the land. Okay. This sounds really serious. So what's happening now? Where's Trudeau? Like, what's going on with that? (laughs) Well, right now, he's basically shoving as many distractions as possible in, like the budget. That was a big one. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, the $41 billion, or I think it's $41 billion or whatever that he of spending that he's going to spend. He said that he wanted to balance the budget, and instead he's going to actually add yeah. to the budget. He's been just adding to the budget. If anything, we all kind of know what Justin Trudeau has been. I mean, take when there was a free trade agreement with the United States, um, how that went. Take the embarrassment that happened in India. Take the pipeline. That's a huge one. And what's the uh, the the pipeline is basically well, it, it's to transport all our oil that we produce, so that we can move it mm-hmm. o- move it overseas and also supply it to the United States. Canada produces about 160, I think it's 160 million barrels a year or whatever. That's our surplus. America only has, I think it's only like 14 percent, like 14 million barrels. So you don't really have a lot of surplus. So you need to buy it from someplace. So we want to get this pipeline in so that to help our economy and help the United States keep its economy running. But Justin Trudeau is a prime minister that is all for the Paris Accord. Right, of course. So he's putting every roadblock possible to turn Canada into, to be in line with that. Like a greener country, basically. Yeah. So moving away from fossil fuels and that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, he's also ran through the carbon tax, which none of the provinces wanted. So that's another sore spot. Okay, so he's been doing that stuff. He's been running unfair interference, distracting people from this investigation. What news is there, Therapy Snack, on the investigation itself? Like, I guess what I'm wondering is, and I have to be fair in this way, there has been talk that Trump has been colluding with the Russians, for which there is no evidence, ever since before he became president, right? And so... That's been on the lips of every mainstream media, you know, source since 2016 and has yielded no fruit. And so in that regard, there's been no evidence. So I kind of like, you know, don't think it's true. So when other people get accused of this stuff, like Trudeau, I want to know how much truth there is to this as well, because uh, apparently there are accusations being made by this woman, you said, Miss Wilson Raybould, accused Trudeau, his aides, and others of applying improper pressure and making veiled threats to get her to reach a settlement in a criminal corruption case. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is that where is that investigation at this point and how much, does it have any legs on it? Is this something that could expose Trudeau as, as actually being corrupt? as opposed to a smear campaign or something of the sort? Theoretically, it has that potential uh, to to reveal whether or not he's corrupt. The reality is, is that at this point in time, from a legal point of view, it's mostly he said, she said situation. What has kind of aided, though, in the idea that there might be some guilt on the side of Trudeau other than his actions, um, which could also just be blamed purely as purely political, which is something you would expect from a political leader yeah the thing that kind of gives it away is the fact that he did admit to essentially violating shawcross shawcross doctrine is a actually it's an uk kind of doctrine or idea that's a constitutional tenant that essentially uh, states that the attorney general is supposed to be separate from the kind of uh, cabinet of the prime minister kind of the whole like separation of uh justice and so that you don't have influence from you know political pundits and stuff like that and one of the stipulations sorry of uh shawcross is that you are not supposed to provide the attorney general unsolicited advice 
And these individuals admitted that they provided her unsolicited advice. She did not ask them for their input, and they still provided it. And that is technically a violation of Shawcross, which essentially says that the attorney general is supposed to solicit advice if they want it. They are not supposed to just receive advice on the whim of whoever the hell's giving them the advice, which is what they admitted to doing. So there is some validity on a legal basis to say that violated Shawcross. Unfortunately, though, most of Canada's constitution is convention, and that makes it very hard to really enforce other than voting people out. Yeah, well, they also use pressure, you know, by um, saying that there would be all these jobs that would be lost, and that SNC was going to leave the country, which is total nonsense. I mean, they've got multi-year contracts already to build things in this country, so it's ludicrous, but they were using that as a uh, word. We're trying to protect jobs and that. Well, they can legally do that under Shawcross. What they can't legally do under Shawcross is they can't provide that advice without the consent of the Attorney General, which they did. They can provide whatever the heck they think is in the public interest. If they think jobs are in the public interest, they can advocate for those. They, they are legally permitted under the Constitution to do that. Well, they can advocate for it. Which but, they did. Uh, remember, this was a criminal thing. This had nothing to do with jobs. This was for uh, criminal actions. That, and there was already a decision that was made. Yes, but the attorney general so, has the I mean, ability the to overturn the decision. That, that that was what they were trying to advocate yeah, for. And yeah, and she didn't want to. And where it becomes wrong... And she, are, yes, she didn't because, want And where it becomes wrong is she never solicited that advice from them. Going on the angle of like, well, the, the pressure was undue and it became uh, criminal and wrong it is nearly impossible to prove, which is why I generally avoid going down that route because I don't like going into improvable things, because that's where you start going into the whole Donald Trump clearly colluded with Russia kind of realm. You go into the unprovable. Yeah, I'm, I, I want to make sure uh, to avoid that as well, because, um, but I mean, it doesn't look good, but, oh, you know, no. <laughs> it's like, let's just talk about the stuff that we can prove, you know? Yeah, I think that, didn't he, like, leave the country or something for a bit uh, when this happened? Trudeau, that is. Yeah, he went to Florida. Yeah, it's not exactly running far, but yeah, it's not like a Roman Polanski, but... Yeah, he had to take a little vacation. Yeah, he went on vacation. Just like the French Prime Minister but, during um, riots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's ludicrous. Okay, so legally this is ongoing, and apparently, I guess, um, Canada doesn't have the same kind of, uh, like, the same kind of investigative team. Yeah, that, they like, do. Like, say, you know, the U.S. Oh, they, they do. Do they? Oh, okay. The problem is the Liberals have a majority government, yeah. and oh, they're okay. all... You know, the, the conservatives and the NDP, for once, they're actually been kind of teaming up with each other. And mm -hmm. uh, so they're trying to get an investigation and get the full story. I mean, she was blocked from being able to say the entire story and what happened after she left her post. So she wasn't able to tell the entire story. They will not allow her to actually do that. And they even stopped a vote to allow an actual proper investigation so that Canadians know the whole story. So they just blocked it, and then mm -hmm. they shoved this budget thing through to show, look at all this money we're going to give you, which everyone has to pay back. Because remember, it's just a few months this fall is going to be the next elections. That's what this is all about. Yeah, there's a federal election coming up next October, right? Yeah. And that's when you guys elect a new prime minister? Is that right? Yes, we hope. But uh, I mean, like you can, you could, in theory, elect a new prime yes. minister. Do you guys have term limits on PMs no. up there? Wait, term limits? Well, they can go multiple times. Yeah, term, but term limits. The amount of terms you can consecutively take or unconsecutively take, correct? Correct. Yeah, like our presidents can only yeah, have two no. terms, for example. No. There, so you could be prime minister for many, many years if you if you keep getting if you keep running and you keep getting reelected. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. So with what we know to be true. Is this really serious? And is this potentially how much more serious? Like, what could be the consequences for Trudeau in, like, say, worst case scenario versus best case scenario, considering what we know? Worst case scenario, there's a guarantee he won't get elected in. And there will be, you know, really? the, oh, yeah, guarantee. There's no way. That, I mean, if he's found guilty 100% that he broke the highest law of the land, that he's playing favoritism with big corporations, which is his writing. You know, Levinland is his writing. And the funny thing is, is when you look at the approval ratings or disapproval ratings, 60% of Quebec, and that's of December, of December 12th, 60% of Quebecers disapprove of Trudeau. So even they aren't happy with him. Yeah, he, has, he hasn't quite been popular. <laughs> no. 
I mean, Saskatchewan is 79% of December. Alberta, we're actually ahead of Alberta. There's 78. I mean, he's got half the approval rating is when he started three years ago. And that's the stats of December 12th of last year before all this scandal came out. So I don't even know mm-hmm. what it is now. And also since then, there's a whole new party that's running. So we got another party that's yeah. running, which I'm probably going to vote for. It's the uh, People's Party of Canada. Oh, what's that? Is that like a populist thing? It's a new conservative party. He used to be a conservative member and he just got fed up with the conservatives because they were too centrist and they were mm-hmm. trying to please too many people. And he feels that, uh, and I feel the same thing, that we actually have an actu- we need to have an actual grounded game plan for this country. We have to have an actual vision. And we have to kind of stick to things. So his yeah. thing is about trying to reduce the amount of refugees that are actually true refugees from crossing the border. And uh, they said that 40% of the refugees that have come over in Quebec, they had to be sent back because they're not legitimate refugees. They don't have any Mm. fear of they're going to be killed or persecuted or anything like that. They're just looking for an easy way to come into Canada. And we have to pay for that. Okay. Snack, anything to add? Uh, to my question or, or to anything that Jonathan said? So for worst case scenario, he gets arrested, but I'm not sure what the precedent for that would be. I'm, I'm honestly not sure about that. The reality is, though, is he's going to certainly suffer in the polls because th- this is broken across even liberal media and government controlled news sources. Like, it, it's it's pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, he's losing his own people, I, I his saw, handpicked I, people. I mean, he's the prime minister that handpicked people to make this balanced government where it has equal representation and have lots of women and lots of different minorities in it. And they're all leaving. So it's not looking good. It's really not. Uh, On top of the fact that from a constitutionalist perspective, this really screws up Canadian like jurisprudence and uh, judicial independence extensively. This essentially violates the rule of law. If what happened yeah. was true in its entirety, it, it completely destroyed that. And it shows a massive yeah. flaw, which there are many. If you talk to constitutional experts in Canada, there, there are a ton of issues with Canadian government. But uh, th- this definitely highlights one of them, which is the fact that uh, there's very little separation between the judiciary in Canada and the essentially political side of Canada, the, the legislative and executive. And that's been known for a while. It's part of the reason why the director of public prosecutions was created, which were the people who decided originally that uh, deferred prosecution agreement wouldn't happen with SNC Lavalin, which is what Trudeau mm-hmm. wanted. And essentially, he asked for the attorney general to intervene, and the attorney general is like, well, no, because they still have the prosecutorial independence, and I don't want to interfere with that. I don't disagree with what they've done. They haven't done anything wrong in reaching their conclusion that they're not going to give them a DPA for a prosecution agreement. And he's like, but but think about the gerbs. And, you know, it's my riding, which if he actually did say that, he hasn't admitted to it. But if he did actually say that, like specifically that it was his riding, that really nails the hammer. Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. nails the nail in the head. Puts the nail in the coffin is what you're saying. Yes, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> nail in the coffin. Yeah, it's okay. It's the nail in the but there's head. A lot of, we have a lot of nail sayings. It's kind of hard to like know. nail down, yeah. which what it is. Well, when you uh, have no legs, they're kind of hard to learn. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's, it sets a very dangerous precedent. It means that if you're For a sure. huge corporation, you can do bribery, you can do all kinds of corrupt things. And also, there's another thing. It really shows the nature of that company because they're basically almost kind of forcing and bribing the government in a way. Because remember, we're an important corporation. If you want to be voted back in, if you want to be looked good in in your people's eyes, we'll threaten to leave. We'll threaten to do these things or whatever, and you'll get, get drummed out. So, you know, that's isn't that kind of blackmail? And we don't need to set a precedent mm. like that. The thing is, if S&C wasn't around, another company would come in. It's called a free market system. And as far as I'm concerned, we need to end all of these. Um, I mean, Trump had it right. And he was really barbing during the free trade agreement. The cartels that are in Quebec, we need to get rid of all cartels. It's not doing the Quebec people any favors. Because what cartels do is they suppress the value of whatever is being produced. And they force all local producers to have to sell to them. So, for instance, something like, Mm. say, maple syrup, they will force all the small producers have to sell to them, and then they stockpile that stuff, and they leak it out slowly so they can control it and sell it at the highest amount. But the one that produced it gets it at a very low rate, while they get it at a higher rate. And it keeps everyone in poverty, which is why for the last 50 years, Quebec has been a 
have not province despite all of the equalization payments that have come in. It hasn't done them any good. It also creates no incentive for the government to actually try to develop themselves because they got to keep everything low and keep everyone at a certain level so they can get the equalization payments. And for people who don't know, what, what are equalization payments? Because we don't have that in the States. Well, basically what it is is provinces that are doing really good in their economy after a certain amount, it's kind of like being wealthy and then you get to a next run of taxes. You have to pay a certain amount out and then that money is divvied out to the ones that are not doing so good. So if your economy is really poor and you have a lot of poor people in that, the wealthier provinces go and send their surplus over to those poor ones so that everybody can actually get by. And right. I don't like that system. It's not a free open market system. It's like welfare. It's welfare. Yeah. For an entire province. Yes, yeah, essentially taking from the most productive provinces, yep. get taxed at a higher rate, and the money that uh, they produce, is uh, that they are taxed or whatever, is redistributed to the provinces that are less productive. And what ends up happening is, is that, uh, you know, some provinces are just like where people essentially just work, like Alberta is one yep. of those. As an example, they just produce, produce, produce. They have the oil and all that. And Quebec is one of those that is always kind of a have-not province or, you know, a, 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 they don't produce anything. So they're always like in need of payments. But if you go to like Montreal, it's like this gorgeous city. <laughs> so yeah. the money's going somewhere. So, yeah, I mean, we're a little off topic, but it is equalization payments are kind of amazing. Well, the thing is, I just have one final thing. Go ahead. The biggest thing about this is, is that it what it creates is kind of like it's dividing the country. All it does is divide the country. As long as we have a system set up for equalization payments, it's always going to create this kind of um, tension and division between have and have nots. And it's not about country building. I'm completely against the whole concept. I mean, can you imagine that in the United States with all your states? If you had to subsidize the debt in California or something like that, yeah, for sure. I mean, imagine no. Texas having to do that, subsidize California. Mm -hmm. It would actually encourage, would honestly, it would, it would encourage states like California and big cities like L.A. and Chicago to be more corrupt than they already are. I mean, Illinois yeah. is the most corrupt state in the country, and it's because of the Chicago government. And if it weren't for the rest of the state being productive, if there was any incentive to be less productive and more corrupt... <laughs> you better believe it yeah. so yeah no it's bad but i'm sorry we're again we're going a little off topic is there anything else about this justin trudeau case so it looks like um it looks bad for him in the polls he there could be some legal repercussions as well and apparently simply filling your cabinet with 50 percent male and 50 percent female members because you're a feminist and believe so much in equality doesn't necessarily make you a good guy and again, going off of what we know, it's like I was just talking about this. I was just talking with, about this with someone. They were saying, you know, it's interesting because the far left seems to be progressives. They seem to be overly concerned with goodness over truth. And I said to them, I said, it's not even that. It's worse than that. They're overly concerned with niceness. They think that niceness is actually better then goodness, they conflate them. And they also think that they're more important than truth, which is why people like on Twitter, blue check marks, the media and so on, they're very insistent that you address people the proper way, you use the right language, you're nice in the way that you behave, and you also virtue signal, like that's important. You have to make open statements that you're against mass murder, that you're against homophobia or racism or sexism. Otherwise, you are complicit in it. You have to become actively nice, aggressively nice even. But the fact is, is that being nice is not good. It's not a good thing by itself. In fact, it can be a weakness and it can be used easily by corrupt people with bad intentions to get away with shit. And I think that it's more important to be good than nice. And the reason why, I, what's more interesting than that is my old comic that I made years ago before I got involved with this was called Good Guy. And my whole point was, and I didn't even realize it till now, but my whole point was being a nice guy, that old saying, nice guys finish last, don't be that guy because it's not appreciated. It doesn't actually increase your value and it doesn't require anything to do to simply make empty statements that sound good. You have to be good. It's what your actions are. And so I'm not concerned with people 
saying the right thing or make empty statements like Trudeau often does. In fact, he's like a very good example of a person that would come across as presidential because he knows what to say and, you know, he knows who's asked to kiss. But it's all empty. There's It's all vacant. There's nothing there. I'd rather have a person who's an asshole but gets shit done like a Bolsonaro or something. You know, but don't worry. He cried during Fort McMurray. It makes it all okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, that's the thing. I mean, he's a real statesman. He's the exact opposite of Trump. I, yeah, for sure. He's a real politician. States statesman's different. I mean, Trump is extremely competent. What he says, he means, and he tries everything he can to make sure he, he does it. Trudeau, on the other hand, he- yeah, but he doesn't say like he puts. I wouldn't say he puts his foot in his mouth, but he what he says is what he says. Yeah, and then people, some people get their feelings hurt. But I don't care about what he says. Yeah, yeah, I care about what they do. Yeah. And I think it is interesting because they are kind of opposites in that way. Which is why, you know, it was a complete mess with the whole free trade agreement. They did not click at all. They did not click at all. Oh, I remember Well, Trudeau even, like, sent a lady who, like, openly hated Trump to literally act as lead negotiator for NAFTA. Like, who thinks that's an intelligent idea? (laughs) I know. It's just insane. Just insane. (laughs) And I mean, 70% of our economy is based off a trade with the United States. And some reason, it gets all focused on those cartels, you know, making sure their cartels are satisfied in Quebec. It's just nonsense. And I would say S&C is one of those cartels that's in Quebec. It's the main construction firm that's managed to spread out all over the place and be as big as it is simply because they've gotten all of the contracts in the country. Yeah. You know, and they were found out. I don't know if they in particular, but I know a Canadian public official was charged and I believe found guilty for essentially getting bribed by SNC Lavalin to build, I forget which bridge, like literally in Canada. Like there, there's, there's, yeah. there's case law that supports that uh, analysis that, that literally they, they've been on the good side of uh, government, especially the Liberal Party. If you take a look at uh, kind of like who they've been with, especially the Liberal Party, they've been on the, the, the goody two shoes side of for the longest time. When it comes to the West, I think there's one thing that any Western country, where it's Canada, United States, New Zealand, Australia, Great Britain, or whatever, the one problem that is really challenging the West right now, and I think it's to do with lobbying. I really think we need to look at the lobbying issue that's going on, the fact that if you're big enough, you can have the biggest say, you know, that you can actually really shape the country itself more than the rest of the people. And that's not a true democracy. That's not a democracy. The problem is we've just let it slip for too long. You know, we're not taking part. And I think that to some degree, it's by kind of subconscious design. The government really did not promote people to kind of get out there and challenge them on things. You know, they made us really comfortable and used to, we will give you the answers. We will even ask the questions, just feeding it to us. And I think we lost the skill to be able to actually do it on our own. I mean, we're good at complaining, (laughs) you know. Everyone's but, good at that. Uh, you know, we're good at complaining, yeah. but... Uh, Any system um, will fail if the people who are in it don't believe in it. Yeah. That's kind of just inherent. Yeah. So any final thoughts or anything else that I should know or the audience should know involving this oh, yeah. story? So kind of two things have happened fairly recently with it. Um, firstly, the Liberal Party, because of its majority, as Dar Haka mentioned, shut down the kind of... Uh, investigative committee, so to speak, on the legislative side, kind of like the uh, current committees that are going on with the whole uh, Russia collusion thing and all that stuff. So you Canada had the same thing going for a little bit in the House of Commons because it doesn't take a majority to initiate uh, kind of a meeting. But the Liberals, within, I think, 24 minutes of the launch of the next hearing, they shut it down within 24 minutes of it starting. So essentially they went through the whole, like, yeah. you know, now announcing whoever and, you know, we're starting the whatever session. Uh, shut it down in like 24 minutes and essentially closed out the entire thing. So that is done for now. And the Liberals shut that down, which was kind of where all the public information was coming from. That's where uh, Race and Wilbo's testimony came from. Well, that's a big oof. Yeah, so it's a big loss for the public. <laughs> it's really telling when they do something like that, especially since Trudeau's whole campaign was based off of, we're going to build a transparency government, a government based off of transparency. And here, they're the ones under fire. It's to do with the conspiracy. And it's like pulling teeth with these people. They shut things down. They, you know, they're, they're doing everything possible to reduce the transparency. Yeah, on top of that, of note, and I kind of mentioned this before, but it's 
kind of important to note. So Michael Wernick, who happened to be the clerk of the Privy Council, which is the highest position you can possibly get in Canada civil service, essentially in charge of the entire civil service side, he ended up resigning very recently because he got called out on actually a few things, including his SNC-Lavalin uh, stance, which he kind of made more public than he honestly should have because he's supposed to be nonpartisan because, of course, it's the civil service sector. But he was like accused of a bunch of things, including making almost continual on-the-record statements, flattering the liberals and absolutely nailing the conservatives. So he got called out for that. And because of the fact that there's a fairly good likelihood that it won't be the Liberals in power next. He resigned preemptively due to the loss of trust from the opposing party that might very well be coming into power after this next election. So he resigned. So that's a massive hit, just generally speaking. And then I think finally, kind of for list, Justin Trudeau appointed a special advisor who goes by the name of Annie McAllen. She was the deputy prime minister during the liberal sponsorship scandal, which is another fun situation. The liberals have a lovely history of uh, scandals, just so we all know. Yes. He appointed her. She also happens to be part of the Trudeau Foundation and a whole bunch of other things. And she was put in charge to essentially find out whether or not we should be separating the attorney general and the minister of justice, which as of now, are actually two in the same office, meaning they're done by the same person, which is not how the UK does it or uh, some other Commonwealth countries because of the risk of interference politically. So she's now looking into that. Her nonpartisan expertise will be utilized. I'm dripping with sarcasm. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how things are developing right. for quote unquote solutions right now is that uh, Trudeau's brought in a quote unquote independent expert and people have resigned. Who really isn't? No, no, she's really not. But that's the whole <laughs> like political spin on it. She's going to provide her independent advice by uh, June 30th of 2019. Wow. Well, I guess uh, really, I mean, like Jonathan said, re-election for Trudeau is not happening so now he's just trying to save his name and perhaps uh, try to keep his butt out of jail perhaps yeah i mean this is the guy that paid for prostitutes for Gaddafi's son what he did. Yep. Gift. <laughs> and bought and bought him a yacht yeah people are like the u.s government's corrupt trust me you have not seen the canadian liberal party <laughs> you have not seen it's unbelievable so i mean we don't even know i mean there could be even more stuff we don't even know about. sure sure so I can see why Trump didn't like him. Well, there you go. Yeah, that's crazy shit, man. I guess we'll have to follow up with this when more information becomes available. But uh, if there's nothing else, I think uh, this is good. It's good to uh, now we can just leave it to the audience to like leave their comments and thoughts about this story. Is there anything else that you guys want to add before we wrap it up? Uh, no legs. Don't step on snack. And I will probably be in the comments section. Okay. All right, well, uh, yeah, I want to know what you guys that are listening think about this story involving Trudeau and the Liberal government, or the Liberal Party, rather, of Canada. Does this come as a surprise? Uh, do you think that it's just his inner Castro coming out and exposing itself? Or does it surprise you? What do you think is going to happen in the future? If Trudeau is not going to be Prime Minister next time around, then who is looking good to be Prime Minister of Canada? Maybe we can strengthen ties between the Canadians and the U.S. again and like work together like we should since we are neighbors. So I'd like to hear what your guys' thoughts are. Please leave us a comment. Also, give this video a like. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already and hit the bell for notifications. Thank you so much, guys. I have been Brian here with uh, Sneck and Direhawk. And we'll talk to you guys uh, very soon on the next update.